Well, my dear friends, on this wonderful Monday evening, you're about to enter a mystifying and bizarre world that I can't even begin to describe in this short introduction. So, my dear friends, sit back and relax with your favourite drink, because it's once again time to listen. The twins look especially beautiful tonight, don't they? My little sister asked, craning her neck to gaze at the odd stick figures twinkling in the night sky above. I shuffle my feet nervously. Aditi, I... You know the immortal Pollux begged his father to let him share his immortality with his brother, she added, almost accusingly, as she stood completely still, transfixed as she seemed to be by the hypnotic shimmering of the Gemini constellation. He was willing to die for Castor. You know I'd do the same for you, I said defensively, in a heartbeat. Her hands balled up into fists beside her. But you can't, can you? I could feel the venom in her voice, the sheer unfairness of the situation ripping her usual composure to shreds. Her eyes finally broke away from the stars and came searching for mine, only to find them running away from a confrontation. Look, the odds of you being picked are low, I mumbled half-heartedly. No, they aren't. It's our block's turn this time. There's only like twenty of us in it. I'm sure you won't get picked, I asserted with a confidence I didn't really feel, not even on a surface level. She caught the lie quite easily, and the pitying look that she gave me broke my heart. I, I want to run away, she stated after a pause. Come with me. I reluctantly shook my head. It won't work. They'll find us even before we get to the highway. And you know what'll happen then. They'll kill us all. Mum, Dad, everyone. Why would that be such a bad thing? She spat. They had me even after knowing what was in store for me. You don't mean that, I protested. Yes, I do, she retorted before taking a deep breath. Regav, she whispered, her lips quivering. I'm scared. Her eyes watered. The facade of toughness she'd so carefully built up finally cracked, letting the vulnerability pour out. I pulled her in for a hug and held on tightly, afraid that it might be the last chance I had to do so. She buried her head in my chest and sobbed silently. I wanted to say something to comfort her, but the words just disintegrated in my brain, and the letters quickly slipped out of my grasp, leaving me a sad and confused mess. As if to announce its own displeasure, the earth then rumbled underneath our feet, tectonic plates shifting and smashing against each other so violently little pebbles vibrated and flew up off the ground. Leaves of the banyan tree we were under rustled frantically as its innumerable roots that reached down to the floor creaked and swayed with the quaking. Something primordial yawned and stretched its muscles beneath the bedrock, causing the two of us to tense up in fear. Half a minute later, the shaking tapered off, and Aditi relaxed, if only a little. You're right, she murmured. Who can ever escape that, right? I opened my mouth to reply, but a loud and persistent boom cut me off. The town's mayor had rung the alarm, signalling that the annual festival was upon us, finally. Festival. Such a jovial name for something so morbid. Let's go, big brother, my sister said derisively. Time to go save the world. Our little town sits in the middle of a valley, near the southern reaches of the lesser Himalayas. The towering snow-capped peaks that loom around us also serve as a jagged boundary with China. Normally this would make it a very strategic position, but the sheer inaccessibility of this place on both sides means that we have next to no military presence in the area, making it ideal for the sort of fucked-up rituals that are performed here on an annual basis. It's hard to say when exactly the sacrifices began, but the consensus in our town is that it was sometime in the early 18th century. Legend says that an adventuring and greedy Mukhal officer started digging around for minerals and precious stones, but only ended up waking something ancient from its deep slumber. The festival began shortly afterwards to placate the potentially apocalyptic entity. The burbling of the creek ahead gently pulled me out of my reverie, 
reminding me that we'd reached the rickety wooden bridge that ran across the little river which came melting down the slopes of the glaciers over to the north and cut our town into two halves before turning and joining the Ganges to our south. As we crossed the bridge and entered the town, I noticed people shuffling out of their homes, unwillingly making their way towards the town hall. Their whispers wafted down the cold air and reached our ears, picking up speed as they caught sight of us. Oh, poor thing. So young too, only fourteen. Oh, I wonder if she'll be picked tonight. Aditi pulled her woolen hat down to her neck, stuffed her hands in her jacket, and continued to walk silently, ignoring the sympathetic looks being shot her way. Oh, she didn't need the pity, as it only made her resent our powerlessness. The smattering of people gradually turned to a thick crowd as we neared the town hall. It seemed like most of our nearly 3,000 populace were coming to the festival. Our town hall was an old and imposing structure, with a sloping wooden roof that the falling snow slid off of and melted into the drains beneath. It used to be the house of the resident British military commander, back when they still entertained foolish notions of invading China through the mountain passes here, but was later turned into the office of the local municipal government, and now it hides our town's darkest secrets. The front door of the building was being guarded by some men clad in bulletproof vests, wearing balaclavas and carrying Tavor rifles. People silently walked past them and took their seats in the numerous rows of wooden benches beyond. On our side of the door was a table covered with white cloth, and a man sitting on a chair next to it, with an open notebook in front of him. Aditi! came a muffled voice from somewhere behind us. I turned around and saw our mother push past the lumbering crowd and hurry over towards us. She pulled my sister into her arms the moment she came close enough to do so. Are you okay? She asked after she pulled away, getting an imperceptible nod in return. Mom frowned, sharp lines springing up on her forehead like Lord Shiva's trident. Have you registered yet? A flash of annoyance crossed Aditi's face. I was just going to, she replied tiredly. Mom held her hand and led her over to the table. She was quite experienced with all this, having gambled with her own life for decades. I still remember how she sobbed with relief when the doctor told her that she'd hit menopause, effectively taking her out of the running. Next, the man at the table shouted. Oh, it's you, Aditi. Glad to see you. Please sign here. He grinned obnoxiously at me while my sister bent over the table. Raghav, good to see you. I refused to respond. So, he continued when Aditi got back up, what number will you be choosing tonight? She shrugged. Oh, come on, he whined. You have to, it's tradition. He pointed at the paper in front of him. These are the numbers still available. Go on, pick one. How does it matter what fucking number gets me closer to my death? God, you asshole, she snapped. Mom squeezed her shoulders and sighed. Oh, fuck. Just 91. I choose 91, okay? Are you happy? That a girl, he said with a painfully artificial smile. We turned and walked into the town hall, trying hard to ignore the sad and inquisitive expressions on people's faces. A couple of rows ahead, I saw my dad standing and waving at us. I could feel a sinking feeling in my chest as the wall seemed to close in around me and the echoing, whispering slammed into my eardrums. I hated this part. The wait before the picking. The anxiety and fear writhing around in my belly. Damn this tradition. Damn this town. Damn this world. We took our seats next to Dad and began waiting in silence for the macabre spectacle to begin. I grabbed my sister's hand and squeezed reassuringly. To what felt like an eternity, the mayor entered the room, flanked by armed guards like the ones we'd seen outside, and went up to the podium on the stage. All around the room were other armed men, looming around us menacingly. I glanced back at the mayor. Sleek grey hair, sleek narrow jacket and a disarming smile. He looked like the typical smarmy politician. 
He tapped the microphone in front of him, and the next second his voice boomed through the loudspeakers and echoed around the tiled room. Good evening, everyone. It is time once again for our town to come together and work for a cause greater than ourselves. It is time for us to put aside our differences and offer a tribute for the sake of our precious earth. You know, it is written in the Gita that... I tuned out, not wanting to listen to the useless spiel he repeats every year, and instead chose to focus on the others around me. Everywhere my eyes went, I could see women of varying ages sitting with their families with fear in their eyes, wondering whether it would be their turn this year. Teenagers, working professionals, mothers, all reduced to mere sacrifices. After a while, it's only natural for one to wonder, is this world even worth saving? And now for the picking, the mayor declared, before going to a table behind him on top of which sat a large rectangular glass container the size of a small aquarium, filled with dozens of numbered chips like the ones they use in poker. Besides the container was a cage with a crow inside it. The mayor opened the cage, and the crow instantly flew out and perched itself atop the container. This is it. We watched with bated breath, as without any instructions, the crow dove in and grabbed a solitary chip in its beak, and flew over to the mare's outstretched arm, who plucked the chip out and gently pushed the crow back inside. Well, 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 he laughed. Seems like we have a winner. Please don't be 91. Please don't be 91. Please don't be 91. It is 91, the mayor thundered, and my heart instantly imploded. He checked the paper in front of him and read out my sister's name. Ah, Aditi Jaswal. Over three thousand heads turned in our direction, some exhausted, some relieved, and some full of outrage at the injustice of it all, but not a single soul offered to help. I instinctively grabbed my sister's arm in a vice-like grip. No, no, no. Mom! she cried, looking at her mother who buried her head in her hands and wept inconsolably. Dad averted his eyes, the coward. Now, now, Aditi the mayor admonished from the stage. You know why we need to do this. You know what is at stake here. We all do, don't we? I saw the masked men approach us, ready to take my sister away. Raghav, help me, my sister spoke in a raspy voice. My heart thudded in my chest. What do I do? What do I do? I should have listened to her. Should have just stolen Dad's car and made a break for it. At least there was a chance we might have made it. But now, I was certain to lose my sister. No, no, no. I saw a hand reach out for Aditi. I instantly swatted it aside and wrapped my arms around her protectively. You can't, I screamed savagely. You can't take her, please. Don't do this, Raghav, the mayor said. We all know this has to happen. Oh, fuck what has to happen, I shouted. And fuck you, you can't take her. I won't let you. We don't have time for this, the gunman to my left said as he tried to pull me aside. Well, something snapped inside me. It was like my mind had been possessed by white, hot, irrational rage. I punched the guy in the side of the head. Then... Almost as if the beast buried in the ground sensed what was happening, the earth shook with such intensity that dust and plaster rained down from the ceiling, making everyone in the hall scream in fear and begin scrambling for the exit in panic. Tube lights broke free from their fixtures and hung precariously overhead as the earthquake showed no sign of letting up. A staccato of gunfire interrupted the chaos, making everyone fall to their knees. Stop, everyone! We don't want to anger the old one, the mayor yelled at his mic, the speaker somehow working still just fine. Well, something slammed into my side, sending me crashing down to the ground. I fought to free myself, but was quickly overpowered by the stronger gunman. He landed rapid blows on my sides, knocking the wind out of me, before pulling a pistol out and aiming it at my head. 
I should just kill you right here, right now, he snarled, the balaclava stretching around his mouth, exposing his fangs. God, I must be hallucinating. My little rebellion had proved to be fruitless, as my sister was dragged kicking and screaming out of the hall, and the rumbling of the earth miraculously stopped almost as soon as she left. Aditi's tear-stained face was the last I ever saw of her, and it would be more than half a decade before I found out exactly what had happened to her. Oh, "'Don't kill him!' my dad exclaimed as he jumped and stood beside me, his hands raised in the air. "'Please!' Spare him. Don't kill both our children on the same night. He has to pay a price. The one aiming the gun at me shouted back. There have to be consequences for insubordination. Take me instead. I'll offer my life in exchange for his. I groaned. No, Dad, don't. The man looked at the mayor, who nodded. A couple of moments later, my father was taken to the stage and executed in front of the whole town. The booming gunshot faded with time, but my mother's heart-wrenching screams never did, leaving a permanent scar on my soul. Six years later. They say that time heals all wounds. I beg to differ. Some injuries don't scab over. They fester, they throb with pus oozing out of them intermittently to remind you of their painful presence. Such was the impact of the events that had transpired more than half a decade ago that it seemed like my life had gotten stuck that night, with my mind acting like a broken record and reliving the deaths of my father and sister dozens of times a day, every day, for years. You see, death isn't really the end. It's just the beginning of a lifetime of pain and suffering for those left behind. I'm reminded of that each morning when I wake up in bed with a start, covered in cold sweat and shivering as flashes of that damned festival haunt my memories and my nightmares, right before my conscious mind peruses them all over again. And believe me, those are the good days, because as traumatizing as those dreams are, it means that I'm at least getting some semblance of rest. Most nights are like this one, however, where my body absolutely refuses to get even a wink of sleep. But that suits me just fine, because on nights like these, sleep is the furthest thing from my mind. Just like it is for Mr. Rathi here, who by all accounts is a hard-working, productive member of our isolated society, except for one little oddity. He doesn't sleep. At all. Never has in his seemingly 40-plus years on Earth. The fact that he's not lost on the rest of our town. But not me, for I've spent the last six years investigating anomalies like him who've infected this town with a persistent virus. The one advantage of being so utterly fixated on that festival six years ago is that it helped me to convince myself that I hadn't in fact been hallucinating when I saw that masked man's razor-sharp canines. Oh, my conviction only grew stronger when I started observing the people around me. Average. Ordinary townspeople going about their lives, trying their hardest to deal with the horror that comes around annually. You wouldn't notice anything weird about them if you weren't paying attention. But I was, quite keenly at that. It took me a while, but I caught on, noticing certain irregularities about some of the people I'd grown up around. People who smiled the wrong way, almost artificially, who never seemed to eat, or, as I later found out, even sleep. The centre of this swirling, all-encompassing storm was one man, our mayor. I focused the lens of my SLR and quickly snapped some clicks of Mr. Ratti, who'd finally come back home after running God knows what errands the whole night. It was 4.30 in the morning, and the sun's first rays were soon going to sneakily claw their way out of the black blanket of the night sky. A couple of hours from now, the man I was following would show up at work, looking fresh and well-rested, almost inhumanly so. I had a couple of theories about what this man was up to, mainly involving vampires and blood, but I wasn't sure of anything just yet. My progress had been slow. I had to carry out my work while maintaining the facade of a grieving yet hard-working member of society, 
if only for the safety of my mother. However, slowly but surely, I was beginning to unravel the mysteries of this place, like the manic obsessive I actually was. As my quarry shut the front door of his house, I put my camera in my backpack, slipped out of the bushes and started jogging back home with my hoodie pulled up. I had to get back before the curious and roving eyes of those on their early morning walks caught sight of me. The cold mountain breeze from the Himalayas was slowly retreating from the valley, and a subtle warmth was beginning to creep in by the time I descended onto the winding cobblestone street that curved its way to my home. I froze as I saw my mother ambling about aimlessly on the pavement outside our house, streetlights harshly illuminating her distressed face. Oh, shit, shit. What was she doing outside? I picked up pace and began running. Her eyes widened as she saw me, her long and disheveled grey hair trembling as she began sobbing and blubbering. What happened, Ma? I asked, squeezing her shoulders comfortingly. Your dad, she cried. I can't see him anywhere. I woke up and he wasn't there. Shh, it's okay. No, it's not, she protested angrily. He's never done this. Where could he be? We have to find him. It's okay, Ma, I replied. Let's go back inside. He'll be back soon. I helped her get back inside the house as she clung to me desperately, like she was drowning and I was a lifeless piece of wood floating in a turbulent sea. It had been like this ever since that night. Her mind had been completely broken and I'd been looking after her ever since. And this damn town wouldn't even let us leave to get us some much-needed help. All I could rely on were the sedatives prescribed by a doctor I suspected was also one of them. I fed her the medicine, after counting, and realizing that she indeed had skipped a dose, and tucked her in, staying with her until she fell asleep. I was cleaning the tables at our restaurant when he walked in. It was early enough in the day that sunlight had just begun streaming in through the glass windows, creating little golden cones for dust particles to dance in. None of our staff had showed up yet, and we had our first customer already. A tall and muscular man, probably my age. He was dressed in black and wearing a thick beanie that he'd pulled down to his forehead. I'm sorry, sir, but we're not open yet, I said apologetically. He waved his hand dismissively. That's okay, I'll just wait. Without bothering to wait for a reply, he plopped himself down at a table I'd just cleaned and began tapping away at his smartphone. I'd been so taken aback by his sudden appearance, I hadn't even noticed that I'd never seen him before. The fact that a perfect stranger had walked into my restaurant slammed into me with the force of a small truck. Strangers are rarer than four-leaf clovers in these hills. Who was this guy? How did he make it all the way here? Was there a safe way in and out of this town, was he working for the mayor? Fear began to claw its way up my spine as I considered the various possibilities. I cleared my throat. Are you uh, new here, sir? I've never seen you before. I am, he replied without looking up. Just passing through. Passing through? He looked up, his lips stretching into a warm smile. Uh, just graduated college. Wanted to um, explore myself. So, hopped into my car, and, well, here I am. He stretched his arms wide. And you just rode in? He nodded. You drove up the road, just like that? Why? He asked, his eyes twinkling. Don't see many strangers in this town? Uh, it's not that. I was cut off as the front door was once again flung open, and in walked the mare, his head brushing against the wind chimes. Well, this day just keeps getting worse. Ah, oh, good morning, Rakov. He strode towards me and vigorously shook my hand. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Mr. Mayor. How about you? I replied as I craned my head slightly to look outside and saw the Mayor's security people keeping watch. Good, good, he replied, before turning to look at the stranger. And good morning to you, sir. Welcome to our town. Thanks the stranger said. Well, I guess it really is true that strangers are rare in this town, if the mayor himself is able to recognize one at first glance. The mayor laughed. <laughs> Touché. We are a very close-knit community, after all. He looked back at me, his brow furrowing with fake worry. How's your mother doing, Ragav? 
He spoke softly. This part of the conversation was clearly meant just for the two of us. I clenched my teeth before relaxing. Some days are good, some not so much. He patted my arm. Terrible business, what happened to her? I could see tears forming in his eyes. That bastard. Please note that we all still stand with you. If there's anything you need, you only have to ask. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. He hesitated, the movement seeming very rehearsed. It's just, uh, I'm worried about you. I've been hearing things, uh, troubling things. Like what? I asked warily. Uh, you've been seen at night, roaming around. Some people are starting to get scared that you might snap. Goosebumps shot up my arms. Oh, no. I'd been so careful. Scratch that. It was foolish of me to think that they wouldn't find out what I was doing all this time. Why was I being followed on my nocturnal outings? I shuddered at the thought. And now, this. He gestured at the stranger. You can see why I'm worried, right? Never seen that man once in my life, I whispered furiously. I swear it. His eyes hardened disbelievingly. You are not a child any more, Agar. You have responsibilities now. A sick mother who needs you. Don't do anything so reckless that you might end up endangering it all. Rage began welling up inside me at that implied threat, but I forcefully pushed it down. He gave me that smarmy smile of his and walked out, after giving a terse nod to the stranger. Fuck. Just when I thought I was getting close to the truth, he comes out and destroys all the progress I'd made. Wait. Had I made any progress, or was he just letting me do all this? Indulging my nighttime activities like a doting father. I had never hated him quite as much as I hated him then, not even on that night. Hmm. Interesting fellow, isn't he? The stranger asked, jolting me back to reality. He sure is, I mumbled, and got back to my work. Hey, tell me something, Ragav. He continued. What exactly happened to Aditi? I jerked back, surprise worming its way through the cracks and spreading on my face. What? I stammered. How did she die? He asked patiently. That mayor was involved somehow, wasn't he? I am... Um, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. What's happening in this town? Something is dangerously wrong with this place. And you know what it is, don't you? Who the fuck are you? I shouted. How does he know so much? No one outside of the town should have access to this information. This was turning into a big problem. He sighed, before taking his beanie off, revealing a strange tattoo banging in the middle of his forehead, right between his eyes. It was a sharp and menacing-looking trident, with a crescent where the hilt of a sword usually is. Name's Rocky. I'm here to help. I quickly reached for my phone to call the mayor and ward off any suspicions against me, but he was quick. He jumped, faster than what I thought was possible, and punched me in the face, knocking me out cold. That was incredibly stupid, you know, Rocky said as he held the ice pack against my jaw. I just groaned in response. Listen... I know I must look very suspicious, but believe me, I'm here to help. Whatever is happening here, I intend to stop it, okay? He added. I guess I'll try and explain who I am and how I know all this. Just hear me out before you decide what to do. And with that, he launched into his story. Unbelievable as it seemed to me. But then again, with everything that I'd personally witnessed, it very well could be within the realm of truth. He claimed to be part of a group of people who hunted, for the lack of a better word, monsters. Our town had not even been a blip on their radar before a Borg colleague of his noticed something strange. Information disappearing from government databases. The strange annual deaths of healthy women in inexplicable accidents. And, most importantly, the strangely high seismic activity in the region. And so I decided to come and personally investigate this town, he concluded. 
I know your sister and your father were victims of whatever is happening here. Help me put an end to this. How do I know you are who you say you are? I pointed out. Just how did you get here so easily? Uh, maybe you're working with them. I instantly regretted saying that. Establishing a line of separation between them and me was not something I should have done, not in front of this guy. My and my mother's survival depended on us ingratiating ourselves with the establishment of this town. Well, how about I show you something to earn your trust? He asked. Come with me. With utmost suspicion and hesitation, I followed him outside, closing the restaurant behind me. I hoped I wasn't making a mistake, and this guy wasn't some psychopath. We walked past unopened shops and run down duplexes, finally turning left near Agarwal Suites, a store that had shut down a decade back when the owner lost his only daughter and his sanity to a uh, picking. The stench of rubble and uncollected garbage hung heavy in the air as we went around to the back of the shop and came upon a Honda City. Rocky led me to the back of his car and popped the trunk open. I yelped at what I saw there. A man was stuffed in the cramped little space, his hands and legs tied together with sturdy, medieval-looking iron chain and shackles. He looked rough, his body covered with numerous bleeding cuts and bruises. I would have run away in fear, terrified at the prospect of being taken to an isolated corner by a psycho kidnapper, if it hadn't been for what happened next. As soon as the man in chains saw us, he snarled with his voice low and guttural, then bared his fangs and lunged at us, only for Rocky to send him reeling back with a solid punch to the face. Believe me now, he asked after shutting the trunk. Fucker and his friends tried to jump me when I was coming here. He's the only one I left alive, for um, interrogation purposes. Holy shit, I whispered. It's real. It's all real. It's all been real this time. All those years I spent trying to prove this, and you did it in an instant. My cheeks felt wet, as tears of relief and vindication streamed down my face. I wasn't hallucinating. There really were monsters in my home. Well, that has to be the happiest I've ever seen someone get after coming face to face with a vampire, Rocky remarked dryly. So, will you help me? I sniffed and shook my head. I don't know. You need to give me some time, man. This is all too sudden. I have a lot to think about. There's my mom. I need to make sure she's safe. Just just let me process this, okay? Yeah, understood. But I would urge you to hurry, he replied. We don't have a lot of time to waste here, right? I should go now. The cook and the other staff should be coming in any second. I shook his hand and took my leave pondering on the strange events of the day. I was glad I had some time to think it all over and didn't just dive into the deep end of this pool of insanity. The mayor was right to be suspicious of him, as he posed the single greatest threat to this grotesque system put in place in this town. I couldn't help but feel giddy at the sight of that vampire. Oh, someone needed to hurt these mothers. I had a pleasant smile on my face, and was happily skipping back the way I'd come, when I was thrown backwards by the explosion that tore through the restaurant. Glass pane shattered, and a blazing hot ball of fire leapt out of the broken windows, hungrily consuming the oxygen in its path, as the concussion of the bomb blast sent me flying back with a loud noise, temporarily robbing me of all hearing. Well, the next thing I remember was hearing Beethoven's Fur Elise blaring away on my cell phone as I gingerly got up, my knees and elbows throbbing with pain. I could see people running around in the area as I almost subconsciously answered the call, with a heavily modulated voice speaking into my ear soon after. Take the advice you were given and back off, Ragav. Next time it'll be your house we blow up, with your mother inside it. It was a terrible accident indeed, but thankfully no one was hurt, the mayor remarked his face a mask of concern that seemed so genuine that it almost fooled me. We stand with the Jaswal family in their hour of difficulty, and we will make sure that adequate monetary compensation is provided to them to help them get back on their feet. What exactly caused the explosion, Mayor? 
the reporter from our local newspaper asked. Was it a gas explosion, as we've heard? It uh, does look like it, but we'll only know after a thorough investigation headed by our esteemed superintendent of police, including inputs from the fire department, he replied. It would be premature and pure conjecture on our part to comment on the nature of the accident at this point. Thank you for your time, Mayor. It's my pleasure. He flashed a smile and sashayed towards his car, waving at curious onlookers along the way, even as firefighters skittered around, trying to put out the blazing fire that still pushed out waves of intense heat in all directions. And that is how our town buried an act of terrorism, by naming it an accident and pretending there was nothing odd about it at all. I shivered and pulled the blanket tight around me as the paramedics peppered me with questions. No, it really doesn't hurt anywhere, I argued. Not just some stupid cuts and scrapes. I'm more shaken than anything. Regardless, you really should visit the emergency ward at the hospital. I shook my head. I need to go check on my mother first. You know I have to. The one talking to me sighed. Okay, but please swing by the hospital afterwards. I nodded before stumbling onto my feet and letting my eyes sweep over the carnage once again. My grandfather had built this restaurant when he relocated from Pakistan after partition. Our family had, over successive governments, poured our sweat and blood into this place, and now it has all gone up in smoke in just a flash. Oh, the vampire's corrupting influence is destroying everything that's good about my town, like an unrelenting plague. I spoke to the employees of our restaurant and told them I'd get in touch with them when things had settled down a little. This was going to be a major pain in the ass, what with the insurance claims, unpaid salaries and our already low savings. But that was a distant, almost comforting concern compared to the threat posed to my existence by the cabal of blood-sucking monsters controlling everything from the shadows. I instinctively knew that we were not going to be safe in this place, no matter how hard I tried to gain the mayor's trust. We must leave this place, and as it stood, Rocky was our best chance of escaping this mess. I found Dr. Malhotra's wagonar parked in our driveway when I made it back home, sending my nerve endings haywire with alarm. I dashed into the house, and almost ran into the balding doctor. What happened, doctor? I panted. Oh, calm down, Rakov, he replied, smiling. It's all good. Your neighbors gave me a call after they found your mother roaming the streets early in the morning, so I just came to check on her. She's doing fine. Just make sure she's getting plenty of rest and that she's taking her medicines on time, okay? I will. I made sure she was sleeping when I left this morning. Oh, didn't know the neighbors saw us outside. God, intrusive little fuckers. Ah, I heard about what happened. You have my sympathies. I would recommend against telling her about it, however. Best not to cause any needless stress. Oh, I won't. Thanks, Doctor. He stopped and... sniffed the air. Hmm. Does something smell weird? I crinkled my nose. No, I uh, can't smell anything out of the ordinary. Hmm. Must be in my head. I shook his hand and saw him off. As his car pulled out, I couldn't help but wonder how he'd found out about the explosion. Was it because news travels fast in this town, which it admittedly does, or is it because he knew a bomb was going to go off at the restaurant because he was one of them? If that was the case, was he really here to check up on Mum, or was this another veiled threat? Oh, a thick fog of confusion clogged my mind, and I felt like a major headache was going to come knocking soon. <sighs> that guy is definitely a vampire came a loud voice from somewhere to my left as I stepped into the house, scaring the daylights out of me. What the? I swiveled my neck and saw Rocky sitting on the plush easy chair in the living room. But when did you get here? As soon as the bomb went off. I swung by here to make sure your mother was fine, he replied. Ah, oh, she's upstairs, by the way, asleep. I had so many questions that it felt like a bomb had gone off inside my brain. How did you know he was a vampire? I finally asked the simplest question I could think of. He pointed at the tattoo on his forehead. Uh, this thing acts like a beacon and alerts those monsters to my presence, which is what he was sensing at the doorstep. Oh, 
So, uh, will you help me? He asked. You know, to take them down. I nodded, but only if you get my mother out of here first. He agreed. Yeah, I can do that. But it'll take some time to set it all up, so you'll have to be patient, all right? Okay, but her safety is a priority. Absolutely. Now, if you're ready, can you tell me what's happening here? I mean, everything from start to finish. Give me all the details. Well, how about I take a leaf out of your book and just show you instead? Without waiting for a response, I began walking towards the trap door near the guest bedroom that led down to the small basement. My grandfather had built that little hole to hide his liquor from the tax authorities during the emergency back in the 70s, and now it was my little conspiracy cave, as I like to call it. It was a small room, only a head bigger than I was, and Rocky had to bend to avoid bumping against the ceiling. I groped around for a thin string that hung from the roof and pulled it. The room was instantly blasted with sharp yellow light, illuminating the wall in front of us that had a broad wooden board attached to it. Notes, photos, and little ribbons connecting them were pinned to the board. All of my research in one place. Wow, Rocky whispered as his eyes swept over my work. This is actually pretty damn impressive. I moved in front of him, and using the material on the board for support, began telling him about our town. The ritualistic sacrifices, the vampires, the earthquakes the supposed primordial entity beneath our feet. I told him all, watching his eyes grow bigger and bigger as he took it all in. Oh, fuck, he exclaimed after hearing my tale. This all sounds unbelievable. Well, I was prepared to hear about a group of vampires feeding on the local populace, but this has me concerned, particularly the ritualistic aspect of it all. You know, he continued, I'd have dismissed it all as a distraction, uh, to keep you all in line while they merrily fed on you, but uh, the scale of it all, and the fact that it was pretty much an accident that we found out about it at all. What about it? I asked, my voice barely audible. No, there's no way that something this big could have been kept under wraps without my people finding out about it, he replied. You have a traitor in your midst. Well, it's the only logical explanation. Good God. I don't even want to imagine what it would be that would make someone betray us. And now I have to be extra careful with who I choose to bring in to help us with this. What do we need to do then? Look, we need more information. No offense to you because you've done really well. But we need to talk to someone on the inside. A light bulb lit inside my brain. The vampire you kidnapped. He nodded. I kept him locked up inside that store. We're going to go talk to him right now. Do I um, have to be there? Yes. Harder for him to lie around someone from this town. He dug around in his jacket and pulled out a small satellite phone. Here, take this. It's more secure than your average cell phone. Plus, they don't know about it. Oh, and I'll help you lose any tail you might have as you make your way back to Garwell Suites. I shivered as I stood outside on the cobblestone streets, but it was more from nervousness than the cold. Are there really going to be vampires following me? Stupid question. A crackling voice came from the phone in my jacket. It's almost guaranteed that they'll have someone following you. So, what do I do? I mumbled with my lips pursed as I began walking down the street, the wind whipping against my face. Keep your eyes open, walk slowly, and without noticeably turning your head, try and see all who are behind you. I can't very well look behind me. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. Do it anyway. I don't see anyone. That's because they're good at their job. Now take the first turn you see. Right or left? Just toss a coin. God, asshole. Okay, okay. I just made a turn. See any familiar faces behind you? I stopped to examine some t-shirts that a street hawker was selling and surreptitiously glanced back. Mm, some. Good. 
Now take another turn. We did this little dance for a good 15 minutes before I finally spotted them. Two guys, one in his 20s and the other middle-aged. Holy shit, I see them. Thankfully, they hadn't seen me see them. Good. Now time to lose those fuckers. How? Find a turn. Some cover or something. Make it seem like you'll be going past it, but then turn suddenly and sharply. Start running when they lose sight of you. Keep finding twists and turns and make your way towards the store. I'll see you there. I'm going to put the phone down now. I have other calls to make. Well, I opened my mouth to voice my protests, but he'd already cut the call, leaving me feeling extremely exposed, even though I'd been alone out here all this time. My hands trembled as I thought about how all those movies are actually so bad at capturing the fear and anxiety that's involved with this cat-and-mouse shit. Aditi would have enjoyed this. She was always the brave and adventurous one, not me. I turned right at the next turn, and bolted down the narrow street before turning right again, doing a quick U-turn, my heart pounding in my chest as I ignored the bemused expressions on people's faces. Yes, Rocky was right. They were good because they were back on my ass within minutes, now fully alert to my attempts to escape. It took me almost fifteen minutes to shake them off, as I dove in and out of shops, ran circles around parking lots, and wove my way around on the roads that I knew like the back of my hand, utilizing my experience to my advantage. But soon, I was confident that I had indeed shaken them off, and started heading towards my destination, praying that my pursuers hadn't been replaced by their friends. I found Rocky digging around in the trunk of his car when I arrived at the abandoned shop. He took a glass bottle out, shut the trunk, and waved me over. Ready to get this started? he asked, before walking into the store, with me sticking to his heels. He kept the vampire chained up in a corner on the first floor of the crumbling building. The room was littered with empty beer bottles and old newspapers, signalling that some homeless people had used this place in the near past. Paint peeling off the walls, a stale musky scent in the air. It was a far cry from the quaint and cosy little shop from my childhood memories. The vampire tensed as he saw us and growled, his voice muffled as it crashed against the cloth stuffed into his mouth. Rocky walked over to him, exposed the bottle, and poured its contents onto his head. The vampire hissed and shrieked in pain, as his skin seared and mottled with contact with the fluid that sent off steam rising into the air as it came cascading down his face, stripping away hair and flesh on the way. "'Whoa, is that holy water?' I asked. "'Nah, just some sulfuric acid,' Rocky replied nonchalantly. "'What?' No fucking way. He shrugged. Well, better it be used on this fucker than some innocent woman being harassed by a psycho stalker. I didn't know what to say to that. At first it seemed incredibly uncomfortable watching this guy get tortured, but then I thought about all the women who died, all the families ripped apart by these savage monsters, and rage came flooding back. Mm, fuck it. All right, asshole, Rocky said as the vampire fought through the pain, his wounds already knitting themselves back up. You have two choices now. You tell me what I want to know right now, or I torture you, and then you tell me what I want to know. Which is it going to be? The easy way, or the fun way? He just glared in response, making Rocky smile. Well then, Rigav, looks like you're going to get a quick lesson in vampire physiology. See, these bastards are strong and durable, like cockroaches. He poured more acid on him, making him groan in pain. Now, a lot of fiction about them is wrong. You know, sunlight, steak, silver, it all does nothing to them. The only way to really kill them is by destroying their brain. He proceeded to kick him in the jaw, his steel-toed boot making a sickening crunch as it slammed into bone, which shattered and began healing again within seconds. <sighs> Look how fast they heal, he added. I watched in stunned silence as Rocky proceeded to brutalize this monster like a master of the art of torture, slicing away at his flesh and bones with his knife like some sculptor. No matter how fast the guy healed, Rocky was always quick enough to inflict some more pain. The 
the shocking thing was how he would himself play the good cop by coaxing him to cooperate, try and tell him how futile his attempts to resist were. Slowly but surely he began to whittle his will down, and I could see the resistance fade from his eyes as his healing began to slow down, until Rocky finally felt comfortable enough to pull his gag off, giving the wounded vampire the opportunity to speak. You, he mumbled, you're all going to die. <sighs> Cute, Rocky interrupted. Cut the threats and tell us what's happening here. You're a fool, he spat, splattering the dust-riddled floor with thick blood. This pain means nothing compared to what'll happen to you when we succeed. What will happen when you succeed? He chuckled. The voice garbled as it pulled itself out of damaged vocal cords. Hell on earth. The ten-headed lord is going to show you what true suffering is, when he arrives back on earth. Rocky was struck silent by this, his jaw dropping, causing the vampire to laugh louder. Oh, you do know what that means, don't you? I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> the fear. Rocky, I whispered loudly. What the fuck is he talking about? Who is the ten-headed lord? Take a wild guess, Rakhal. The vampire chortled. I'm sure you can figure it out. No, it can't be. Rocky took his knife and stabbed the vampire in the head, forever silencing his obnoxious laughter. What? What's happening? I didn't get the answer to that question, because the next second a powerful earthquake shook the very foundation of the building making it groan dangerously as dust and plaster lashed down from the ceiling. I screamed at the intensity of the quaking. It was the most powerful one to have ever hit the area in my entire lifetime, almost as if the hulking beast below had been offended that someone had dared to refer to him out loud. Go, Rocky shouted. This place is going to collapse. He was right, because as we ran down the stairs and jumped out of the door, something gave in with a loud crash the building began to collapse in on itself. But thankfully only after we'd retreated to the safe distance of Rocky's car, which was quivering as the ground beneath it shook tumultuously. We grabbed onto the car and waited for the calamity to pass. The alarm ripped through the air almost as soon as the shaking had stopped, sending dread sprinting down my back. Oh no, I mumbled. This can't be happening. What? Rocky asked. Fear and disbelief still writ clear upon his face. It's, it's never happened in the daytime before. What hasn't? The, the festival. It's time for another sacrifice. Even after all these years, even after knowing that no one in my family is in danger of being picked anymore, the blaring call of the alarm still doesn't fail to cause a suffocating tightening in my chest, as if someone is tugging at an iron chain looped around my heart. Why? Why now? I muttered. That the festival would take place when the sun still towered over the Himalayas was unprecedented. Granted that it was being rapidly shrouded by a thick layer of fast-gathering clouds, but that doesn't change the fact that we'd never had a ritual when the sky wasn't dark and dotted with the sort of bright stars you'd never see in the cities. Rocky, who still seemed quite disturbed from our conversation with the vampire, snapped to alertness at the sound of my voice. This is it. We can find out where exactly the sacrifices are taken after the picking, and stop all this before they succeed. What? I exclaimed. Just the two of us? Against hundreds of monsters? You can't be serious. I am, he replied resolutely. We don't have a choice. If we don't act now, we'll be signing the death warrant of this world. We have to move. Now. <laughs> I stammered. What do we do? Try and find out what car they're using to transport the girl who gets picked tonight, and what direction it's going in. He patted his jacket. You still have your sat phone, right? I nodded. He turned and walked towards his car, then opened the trunk and started digging around. I watched in silent fascination as he removed a false floor to reveal a sleek black box at the bottom, which he opened with a smooth click. My eyes popped out of my head 
as I saw the eclectic assortment of guns carefully arranged in the box. He pulled out a mean-looking revolver and handed it to me. This, he said, pointing at the gun in my hand, is a Smith & Wesson 500. It's not a gun, but a hand cannon. Any of those fuckers get close to you, aim center mass and squeeze the trigger. Remember, squeeze, not pull, because the recoil of this thing is a bitch. He also took out a shoulder holster from the box and gave it to me. Now, this gun won't kill them, but it'll stop them for a while and buy you some valuable time. Time that you should use to run away and come find me, okay? I've, um, never fired a gun, I blubbered. Ah, oh, there's a first time for everything. Think about what they did to your sister and shoot them, understand? I gritted my teeth and strengthened my resolve, as he then gave me a quick rundown of how to safely handle the weapon and help me sling it around my shoulders underneath my jacket. Okay, keep your cool and try not to stand out. Get in touch with me as soon as possible after the picking. I'll be nearby. The first thing I noticed as I began walking towards the town hall was that the earthquake had proved to be much more disastrous than I'd previously assumed. A long gash had opened up on the road that ran from our local high school all the way to the town hall. I shuddered as I looked at the seemingly bottomless crevice, imagining some unfathomably large entity trying to claw its way out of it. No, no, now I had a name to put on the faceless monstrosity being used to terrorize all of our lives, don't I? No, nope. don't think about it. Don't think about it. There was a strange energy in the air that night. The townspeople looking way more animated than they usually do on a festival day. I strained my ears to catch their whispers, and what I heard pretty much froze my blood. Are you guys okay? Yeah, did you hear that some buildings east of the river collapsed? Really? Are they rescuing those people right now? Aren't they postponing the festival? My heart began racing and sweat streamed down my brow. Mom, God, how did I just forget about her? Was she hurt in the quake too? My feet were moving towards my house, even before I had made a conscious decision to do so. It wasn't what I'd agreed to do, but Mom came first even if it led to problems later on. I ran in the opposite direction of the crowd. Some faces in the thronging masses looked warily at me, but no one had the heart to call me back. The festival just saps people of their usual intrusiveness. As I jumped onto my street, I saw my house standing proudly upright as ever, and I felt my shoulders relax. The front door was locked, so it seemed that my mother had joined the congregation at the town hall. I doubled back, panting and wheezing as I sprinted down the desolate streets before finally arriving at the town hall, now surrounded by armed vampires in balaclavas. I couldn't help but notice that they were noticeably fewer than what is the norm. Regardless of that, my hand instinctively went to touch the gun for comfort, but I caught myself and began walking up the marbled stairs. My stomach turned as I saw the empty desk and chair to my left, remembering how my sister had herself picked the number all those years ago that had led to her death. As I entered the hall, the loud and outraged echoing buzzing of the townspeople slammed into me full force. They were concerned about the intensity of the quake, and rightfully so. What was the point of sacrificing your family members if it doesn't actually sate the angry monster? I took a seat in a corner and began looking around for my mum, getting a little flustered when I couldn't spot her. That's fine, I tried to tell myself. It's a big place. Maybe she's somewhere my eyes can't reach. It wasn't long before the mayor arrived with his usual coterie and hopped over on the stage, with the crowd instantly falling silent at his arrival. He tapped the microphone, frowning when it shrieked before settling down. He finally smiled and began speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. It is time once again for our town to come together and work for a cause greater than ourselves, to put aside our differences and offer a tribute for the sake of our precious earth. I know it is unusual for us to be doing this in the day, but these are unusual times, made so by an external influence. As he continued to speak, rain started falling against the looming roof, the sound louder and more intimidating to us on the inside. 
Thankfully, the speakers were even louder. There is a malicious force, one that is seeking to disturb the natural balance of our beautiful world, and I'm afraid it is what is responsible for the unusual situation we find ourselves in. What? He couldn't possibly be talking about Rocky, could he? The rainfall increased in intensity, angrily lashing against the frame of the town hall. I sat up straight as I heard what faintly sounded like a gunshot coming from outside. But don't worry, it is being handled. The intruders will pay for their egregious actions, and so will anyone caught assisting them. He took a pause at that moment to let his statement sink in. My shoulders deflated as I tried to hide from what I imagined to be accusing eyes. The mayor continued. However, their corrupting influence has come with a cost. A cost that, unfortunately, we will have to pay. Murmuring around me rose up once again. The mayor's face fell. A phony act that I saw through instantly. It pains me to say that this year a single sacrifice won't be enough. There need to be ten this time. The thunderous uproar that followed his statement easily dwarfed the storm raging outside. People stood up angrily shouting and waving their hands to register their protests. The woman next to me began crying at the mayor's declaration. My mind was numb to the pain and shock of those around me, as I was too busy trying to understand the ramifications of this turn of events. Ten. Ten women or ten heads for the ten-headed lord. A loud gunshot startled me out of my reverie as one of the mayor's lackeys fired in the air to quell the agitated mob, some of whom were attempting to charge the stage. Thankfully, the mayor continued, unfazed by the display of aggression, we already have a volunteer, so we would only need nine more now. This was strange. Volunteers had never been allowed in the festival, such drastic changes can't signal anything good. One last thing before we begin the picking. For this one time, age-related restrictions are off. All women of any age are eligible for selection. It was as if the town hall itself gasped at this, and the vampires had to resort to firing in the air once again to prevent a full-blown mutiny. The gunfire muted their anger, but only on the surface, because even a precursory glance around the room would tell you about the seething rage coiling behind the hardened eyes of those in attendance. That is, if you ignore those women who were snapping under the weight of their unresolved trauma that had come flooding back with a vengeance as the prospect of being picked once again loomed ahead of them. I recoiled with disgust as I thought about how children, prepubescent girls, would now be considered for the festival. But why? Why change it up now? What was so different about this one? And now, the mayor continued, it is time for the picking to begin. He stepped away from the podium and walked towards the table with a painfully familiar glass container and the bird cage. The crow cawed and fluttered its wings as it saw that it was time to do its job. This is it. It's go time. I tensed up and began plotting my actions for when the girls are being transported. If there are so many girls being taken this time, will they all be put in one large vehicle, or will they be transported separately? I didn't recall seeing any truck or something outside, but then again I was in a hurry to get inside and might not have noticed. I heard shouts of horror from a couple of rows ahead of me, as a mother of two young kids was picked by the crow, and then dragged outside by the vampires through the front door right beside me. How do I get outside? They never let anyone leave for a good while after the picking is done. Where's Rocky? Is he close by to observe the eventual transportation, or is he maintaining a safe distance? If it's the latter, like I imagined it was, then I'd need a very good excuse to get out of here and track the car. More girls were picked as I chewed my lips and considered my options. My heart began racing as time ran out. Only a couple of girls to go. What do I do? Come on, think. I could pretend to be sick. <laughs> Would that work? No. They'll shut me down straight away. What then? Should I just shoot the two guards at the front door and make a break for it? No. 
That's fucking stupid. And that concludes our picking for this year. The mayor's voice boomed from the speakers once again. Until next time, then. I'm sorry, but we can't have the traditional dinner this year. What with the weather and all. He laughed obnoxiously. Now, if you'll please excuse me. And with that, he descended the steps and began walking out, smiling and ignoring the angry screams around him. I was glad that no one had been as stupid as I was to try and attack them. Dealing with a lifetime of guilt of causing your father's death can destroy someone. I shot out of my seat as soon as the mayor had left and approached the main door. Others had the same idea, and the front door was quickly turning into a mosh pit, but the unnaturally strong vampires easily held us off. Hey, let us through. Come on. My house collapsed through the earthquake. I have to check my son. Step aside. I craned my neck to try and see what was happening outside, but to no avail. The women had been taken outside my field of vision, which was already obscured by the rain which continued to patter the ground. Someone shorter and smarter than me broke the standoff by ducking and slipping past the fleshy barricade. One of the vampires turned to look at the runner, and this was the opportunity we needed. The floodgates opened, and we swarmed out like little ants scurrying out for food. Even the vampires found it difficult to control us all. I quickly ran to higher ground, my clothes getting soaked almost instantly as I began looking around wildly for any signs of the sacrifices. There! A big green military truck, and I could see the women inside it. Most of them, including my mom. My heart almost exploded out of my chest with shock and fear. No, no... She was the volunteer. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I found cover behind a house and took out my phone, quickly punching in Rocky's number, and waited, and waited. Why was he not picking up the phone? Fuck, did the vampires get him? Was that what the gunshot was about? I almost cried with relief when his voice finally crackled through the phone. Regrav, he panted. Talk to me. Green military truck headed northwest towards the hills. There are ten women this time, not one. Yeah, figures, he breathed. Okay, you stay hidden. Let me deal with this. I'll call you when... I cut him off. No, that's not happening, Rocky. They've got my mum. I'm coming. I have to. All right, do what you feel you must. But your life will be in your hands. Fine with me, I snapped. Why the fuck do you sound so tired? Ah, uh, preparing a little surprise for our friends. What surprise? A large bang ripped through the air, the intensity of the blast causing its own little tremors. My jaw dropped as I noticed flames coming leaping out of the police station to the east, brushing aside the rain with disdain and splashing the dull sky with their dazzling orange brilliance. <sighs> that, Rocky replied smugly. There was complete chaos outside the town hall, immediately after the explosion at the police station. The vampires, never having faced such boiling rage from the townspeople before, made a grave mistake. They opened fire on them. I snapped my head at the echoing gunshots and watched with horror as bodies began to drop one by one, splashing as they hit little puddles in the asphalt. And then, the people mutinied. You see, there's only so much you can push people, before they lose all fear, and even a cornered rat would strike back at much larger predators. Devastated at the loss of their family members, outraged at the sheer unfairness of this year's ritual, and seething at the killings right in front of their eyes, they snapped, and instead of cowering at the gunshots, lunged at their tormentors. Dozens of them began just hammering away at each vampire in the vicinity, who, caught by surprise, were actually starting to lose the fight. I doubt that would last forever, and I didn't want to be around for the carnage that would take place when the tide inevitably begins to turn. Besides, I had a big green military truck to follow. I looked around wildly for a car or something, and my eyes quickly settled on a Royal Enfield bullet, with its key still in the ignition. <laughs> Thank fuck for careless owners. I dashed to the bike and hopped on it, 
deftly turning the key and kickstarting the hulking beast of a motorcycle, which roared to life, and off I went, twisting and turning through the winding and undulating streets, going in the opposite direction of the truck, letting staccato gunfire and screams fade away into the background like white noise. Rather than blindly following the vehicle, I chose to go for the higher ground to figure out exactly where the truck was headed, and then get started with my pursuit. Falling droplets of water rode the wind and lashed against my skin, obscuring my vision and chilling me to the bone. For a second I feared contracting pneumonia, but then realised that if I lived long enough to catch a damn cold, it would be the biggest blessing imaginable. I stopped my bike when I was satisfied with my position and began scouting for the truck after wiping my face. After spotting my target, I pulled out my phone and called Rocky. Where are you? I asked. Head in northwest, he replied, huffing. Damn, these fuckers are persistent. I know where they're going, I said. The superintendent of police owns a vacation home up in the hills. That's where they're headed. Yep, I know. See you there. And he cut the phone. I drove over the bridge that spanned the now raging river and cut my way through the commercial area of the town, riding past my own burnt-down restaurant and moving on to the outskirts before entering the woods on the steep incline of the jagged peaks of the lesser Himalayas. The thick canopy of coniferous trees somehow intensified the rain, which resembled water gushing out of a faucet as it accumulated on leaves and branches and noisily pulled down, flooding the mountainous road. I squinted to see through the black, hazy veil of water, and I pressed on. I wasn't exactly a frequent visitor to these parts of the woods, but was still faintly familiar with them, so I chose to stop at a reasonable enough distance from where I calculated the vacation home supposedly was. No sense in charging in and immediately being killed by snipers. I pulled the s &W revolver out, took a deep breath, and began jogging up the road, sticking close to the woods. I spotted the truck about ten minutes later, sitting on the side of the road, next to a slushy dirt track that curved to the left and ran up to the as-of-yet unseen house. I ducked into the woods for cover and slowed my approach, my shoes plopping in and out of the slippery and muddy ground. Soon I reached the clearing where the house was situated. I peeked up from behind a deodor cedar tree and scanned the house and its surroundings. As suspected, I couldn't see anyone. Whoever was guarding this place was well hidden. I tried calling Rocky, but I couldn't get through to him. The house was basically a bigger-than-average log cabin with a slanted roof, painted a bright shade of green. I was contemplating my next move when a sharp crack echoed through the clearing, making me stumble to my knees as my legs trembled and gave out in fear. What the? Did someone just shoot at me? Another gunshot followed a couple of seconds later, and then my chest vibrated. Nope, I didn't get shot. It was just my phone but the shock was pretty much comparable. It's me, Rocky spoke through the phone. Where are you? Near the house. You? The area is clear. Lay your gun and come on out. I complied and warily walked out into the clearing, feeling extremely exposed in the open area with only the rain around me. Thankfully, Rocky came around from the other side, waving one hand to grab my attention and carrying what looked like a long sniper rifle in the other with a backpack slung over his shoulders. You got them all? I asked loudly. Yep, knife three in the woods, took out two in the house, he replied, jerking his thumb at the cabin. I craned my neck and could vaguely make out a figure slumped against a couch inside. Where are the sacrifices? I questioned. Not here. Footprints run out the back door before disappearing a couple of meters out. Rain washed away all tracks further out, but they're definitely in that direction. Fuck, I exclaimed. Don't worry, he replied. I got one of them to talk. There's a cave out there in the woods. Digs deep into the mountains. That's where the treasure is. Shall we? It took us a good fifteen minutes to wade our way through the treacherous ground and the increasingly thickening woods. Thorny branches swung and slashed at our faces as the unrelenting rain continued to bear down on us with thunder ripping through the menacing cloud cover. God, I can't even remember the last time it rained this badly. 
But then again, it's hard to gauge the intensity of a storm when you're inside your cosy little homes. After a long and grueling journey, and an equally tiresome search, we found the cave, carved into one side of a looming wall of rock, yawning like it was the mouth of some petrified demon of yore, waiting to devour anyone foolish enough to step in. Rocky tugged at my arm as we stood in front of the gaping wound at the side of the mountain and asked me to stop. I fidgeted on my legs and wondered what he was waiting for when he pulled out a large syringe from his backpack, containing an oddly luminescent and gelatinous blue-coloured substance, and injected himself with it. What the fuck is that? I asked in shock. Oh, a gift from my organisation, he groaned and replied. This is what helps us take on monsters with supernatural strength. Well, I just filed that away for later on. No time to be worrying about such trivialities now. He once again dug around in his bag and took out a flashlight. The conical light that came out of it seemed to get swallowed instantly by the oppressive darkness beyond. I gulped as I looked at Rocky and followed him into the cavern. My body would have welcomed finally getting the opportunity to dry off, if it wasn't for the immense feeling of dread that crashed into it as soon as I stepped into the cave. Something was telling me to tuck tail and run away, that every step I take deeper into this place was a step closer to a fate worse than death. Every sound that reverberated in the long and narrow passage, every putrid stench that wafted up the stale air, every shadow that flickered on the wall screamed at me to escape but I pressed on. The loud pattering of the rain faded away to be replaced by an unsettling silence as we walked deeper and deeper into the cave. The path twisted and turned, before plunging down at such a steep angle I had to grab onto the side walls to stop myself from sliding down. And then it bent and rotated, such that we were walking in the opposite direction we'd come in, going under the mouth of the cave. Surprisingly, not once did the passage become any narrower than what it had been at the entrance. It was almost as if some gigantic worm had dug its way around into the mountain. Every hundred metres or so along the way, Rocky would dig around in his bag and pull out some brown cuboidal packets with old Nokia phones attached to their sides and place them next to the walls here and there. Well, I didn't comment on the latter. If what the vampire had told us was right, we would need the explosive. It was a particularly cold draught rushing up at us at an astonishingly high speed that alerted us to a change in the passage, which opened up to an impossibly large clearing. Rocky put his hand up and made me stop right as we got to the edge of the clearing. And cautiously, the two of us poked our heads out and looked at where we had ended up. It was a big open space, the size of a cricket stadium, with a wide arched roof a couple of hundred metres up, dotted with tiny holes that let rays of light and water droplets pass through. All around I could see stalactites and stalagmites, some of which had joined together to form long, spindly pillars. It was a wondrous sight, sure, but it was the wall to our front that instantly drew our attention. Etched on the rough and towering wall opposite us were various symbols and images associated with the worship of Lord Shiva. I shuddered as I remembered that Ravana, the ten-headed demon king, was one of the greatest devotees of the Lord in his time. Be careful, Rocky whispered, and continued to stay still. Something moved near the wall before disappearing behind one of the natural pillars. My heart thudded in my chest. I recognised that figure, or the dress it was draped in, because I had personally bought it for Mum. And I say it here, because that figure was too broad to have been my Mum. Ragav, Rocky screeched, his voice barely above a whisper. Come back! I didn't even remember walking out into the clearing, but by the time I was alert again, I had already reached the halfway point. From here I could see the wall clearly, and the seemingly hundreds of human bones, old and new, littering the ground close to it. My mind hadn't even registered this strange sight, when the figure I'd seen earlier stepped out from where it was hiding, making me scream in utmost terror. It was my mum. Well, mostly. 
She had a long bamboo pole fixed horizontally to the back of her neck, and a nylon rope that looped around her throat and stretched to the two ends of the stick, firmly tying both of her hands to them. But that wasn't the strangest thing, however, because on each side, heads of the women who'd been picked were somehow resting on the bamboo pole, five on one side, four on the other. Heads that were alive. Heads that were snarling angrily, with saliva coming out of their mouths in thick rivulets as blood cascaded down from where their necks should have been. My mother, her face contorted into an expression of disbelieving horror and anguish, also had about twenty arms coming out of her sides, ripping and tearing their way out of her flesh and clashing against each other as they flailed around. Beautiful, isn't it? came a loud and oddly happy voice, echoing off the various reflective surfaces in the space. Hundreds of years of work finally paying off. Regav! my mom cried, her voice hoarse, as if the very act of speaking was the most painful thing in existence. Mom! I almost thought I would fail. That disembodied voice again. I recognized it, especially when it was booming like this. Your hunter friend made me lose quite a bit of confidence. At the last stage, I was even forced to use women who couldn't menstruate anymore to get this done, with the Lord being very picky about only having fertile women, considering what killed him the last time. I thought it would all fall apart, but here we are, and this time there's no wronged husband from heaven to slay him. Fuck you, I swore at the mayor. Let my mother go. <laughs> Let her go, he laughed. I'm afraid it's far too late for that boy. I started to get closer to Mum, but her eyes widened. No, she cried as multiple arms reached out towards me hungrily. I jumped back instinctively, feeling guilty for doing so. Ah, she's changing, the mayor said. Her body is transforming into the perfect vessel for our law. Why? Why are you doing this? I shouted, my hand clenching my gun tightly. Power, money, you know, the usual vices, he replied. Regarve, Rocky screamed from somewhere behind it. Step aside. I glanced back and saw Rocky aiming in my direction with his rifle. No, you can't kill her, I shouted back. We have to, he countered, while we still can. Step aside or I'll kill you too. Oh, you think you can kill him that easily? The mayor continued, mockingly. It took me three hundred years to get to this point. I was a slave in Zulfikar Khan's army when I started this, drinking horse blood to survive. You know how hard I've worked for this? <laughs> you think I would have let you come all this way if I wasn't sure of the outcome? Just then, one of Mum's heads, the one furthest to the right, exploded, spraying blood and chunks of flesh in all directions. I was about to accuse Rocky of shooting at her, when, with a sickening crunch of bones and tendon snapping, that head began to reform. First the skeletal structure materialized, then the flesh and blood began flowing over it, till a new, decidedly masculine head appeared, the visage much more vicious, emanating pure evil from its bloodshot eyes. Mom screamed in fear as another head, this time to the left, popped. I heard footsteps behind me as Rocky began moving into a position where he could get a shot off. I stood frozen, not knowing how to react to this strange sight in front of me. What should I do? How do I help Mom? Ah, oh, there he is, the mayor screamed. Get him! Chunks from pillars behind me exploded out as the vampires opened fire on Rocky, and I heard him scream in pain as some of the bullets got through. But I wasn't paying attention to that. I was far too fixated on the fleshy blob that was my mum. Rugav! she groaned. Please! What, mum? I cried. What can I do? How can I help? Run! she whispered as another head reforged itself on her right making it six demonic heads now. The bamboo snapped into two, falling off her body, but the head stayed attached somehow. Mum's body had begun to morph too, 
her chest flattening and becoming more muscular as her legs thickened to the size of tree trunks. She stepped towards me, her heavy feet pounding the ground, sending shivers down my side as the thought of a crazed and murderous elephant flashed through my mind. She took another step, and I backed up, purely out of animalistic instinct of survival. Suddenly the gun in my hand felt far too real, as the prospect of using it loomed large in front of me. Rocky's gun cracked, sending a bullet through three of Mum's heads, making her reel. She shook it off, but it gave me the chance to run towards the man who had shot her, as bullets whizzed past me. Rocky fired more bullets at her, the little projectiles from the fifty cow rifle punching through the hellish body even as the vampires tried to kill us. I turned my head away, not wanting to witness this brutal battle. No! the mayor screamed. Not both. Leave the boy alive for Ravana, unless one of you idiots wants to be food for the Lord when he wakes up. Kill the hunter instead. The echoing gunshot stopped, and I heard skittering on the walls. They were coming to kill Rocky with their bare hands. You okay? I asked. Mom screamed, and I tried to blot out that sound. Yeah, he groaned. Just a scratch. Well, he'd taken multiple bullets, but strangely enough, those wounds weren't bleeding quite as much as they should have. My mind went back to that injection he'd taken. What the fuck was that? Listen, he continued. We have to kill him before he takes his form, all right? Destroy the heads and shoot him in the navel. It's... it's my mom. Not anymore. I can't. You have to, he snapped. The whole world could fucking end if we don't stop that thing right here. Do you understand? I opened my mouth to say something, but was cut off by the vampires who yelled and charged in. However, Rocky met them head on, punching and slicing away with his knife. Their movements were a refined blur, unnatural strength complementing the experience that comes with an enhanced lifespan. But Rocky more than held his own, his blade slicing away at their flesh, whittling them down a tendon at a time. The sound of his knife as it whirred through the air and slashed at flesh and bones was oddly repulsive and yet musical at the same time. I couldn't help but think of Mozart's lacrimosa as he sliced the blood-sucking parasites to pieces. One of them lunged at me, but I was quick on the draw, aiming at its midsection and pulling the trigger. Rocky was right about the kickback of the S&W 500, as it made my hand jerk upwards causing the bullet to smash into Mr. Rati's face, obliterating his skull instantly. Damn, that gun was loud. A loud scream ripped through the cacophony of the melee, and the next second Mom appeared in front of us, her body completely deformed, except for her head. Ravana was an inch away from fully reincarnating. He wasn't fully there yet, and the lack of control he had showed in his actions. Mom's face scowled in rage as the demon began ripping apart anything that got close to him, including the hapless vampires who were ripped apart and tossed aside like ragdolls. Rocky jumped at him, but he caught him and shot him across the clearing, smashing him into the rock wall on the other end, leaving only the two of us standing. Mom, I whispered, aiming the gun at her. Yes, her. Oh, she was still my mom. She growled and started coming towards me. Please, don't. Tears streamed down my face as my finger rested on the trigger. I knew I had to pull it, but I just couldn't. I gave up, letting my hand fall to my side. I had lost everything. All my family was dead. If this is how it ends, then let it. There are worse ways to die than at your mother's hands. I closed my eyes and waited for the inevitable. I felt a warm and rancid breath on my face, but then it was gone, and I heard subsequent roars sounding distant. I opened my eyes and saw her climbing the rock wall, pulling herself up with twenty arms. Did she spare me? Was my mother still in there somewhere? What in the world was she doing? I got my answer the next second in the form of the anguish-filled screams of the mare, 
who was then slammed into the ground a short distance in front of me. His body covered in blood and missing half its limbs, he lumbered on to his one good foot and coughed as he saw me. I didn't hesitate at all when I fired at him, my steady hands now used to the recoil. The bullet hit him right above the nose, puncturing his skull and blowing out the back half of it with the exit wound. I sighed in relief. At least one thread had been taken care of. Killing the mayor had given me some semblance of confidence, a fleeting feeling that was shattered to pieces as the demon jumped down and appeared in front of me once again. Mum was gone. Not even a trace of her was left, with all ten heads now completely demonic. Ravana was here. I shot at him, but he caught the bullet with his teeth, and I immediately wet my pants. It's been so long, he growled, his oddly smooth voice rattling my bones. Mom, I cried softly. Mom, he asked. Then the realization dawned on him. Ah, oh, you mean this vessel. Half a dozen hands patted his torso before stretching. Oh, this feels good. He was cut off by a bullet which slammed into his navel, sending him reeling back. Then more bullets came searching for his heads. Shoot him. Shoot for the heads. A weak voice from behind me called out. Holy hell. How the fuck was Rocky still alive? Rather than wasting my time contemplating the oddities of his continued survival, I focused on the task at hand and fired my remaining bullets at the honking beast. Ravana roared in pain, flailing around to dodge the bullets which kept finding their marks until he finally keeled over and fell backwards, moaning softly in pain as he continued to writhe, kicking up dust in the process. I dashed to where Rocky was kneeling and fired at the King of Demons. Will this be enough? Will this kill him? I asked. He shook his head. No, not even close. Nothing less than a divine weapon will put this fucker down once again. But we can trap him here. Quick, let's get the fuck out. I slung his arm around my shoulder, and together we hobbled out, as quickly as we could, before Ravana could get back up again. We walked past the carnage, back up the path we'd taken, trying to put the horror we'd just witnessed behind us. Rocky was terribly wounded, but that stubborn bastard was still alive. You know, I groaned, if we get out of this alive, you'll have to answer a shit ton of questions. Well, he must have made it about halfway back when we heard Ravana again. But luckily, we'd already walked past the first C4 packet. Well, here's hoping the roof doesn't completely come down on us, Rocky whispered as he detonated the bomb. The blast sent out a dust-riddled gust of wind, bringing the roof down with it, but miraculously not burying us alive. God must have been watching us. Oh, Rocky must have been one hell of a civil engineer, because we kept detonating the bombs and still somehow made it out to the surface, relatively unscathed. Physically, that is. You think that'll hold him? I asked, as I felt the soft orange rays of the evening sun prick my skin. The thick rain clouds had finally dissipated. Well, for a while, he admitted. Isn't that bad? Nope, because the cavalry is here. I looked behind me and saw about a dozen armed men with trident and crescent tattoos on their foreheads come out of the bushes. Oh, Rocky, you look fucked up, said a guy who seemed to be their leader. Oh, Lucky, <laughs> it's damn good to see you, brother, Rocky said as he pulled the man into a hug. So, it's true then, he's back, Luck asked. Rocky nodded. Yeah, but he's trapped down there. Let's make sure it stays that way, at least until we can find a way to kill him for good. Ah, oh, we've got every freaking operative we have involved with this. We'll make sure to stay on top here. All cave entrances in the freaking state will be sealed up. Oh, he's not getting out. Excuse me, I interrupted. What happened to the town? Ah, oh, the vampires caused a lot of damage, but fled as soon as we showed up. Lucky answered. Thank Rocky for contacting us, or else everyone would have been killed. Don't worry, we'll hunt him down. He smiled. No, more like bared his teeth 
like a shark. I didn't broach the topic of them having a traitor in their midst. Didn't seem the right time to do it. My shoulders deflated. Well, we might have stopped the apocalypse, but my life was pretty much over. I watched as the hunters spread out, setting up camp outside the cave entrance. Hey, you handled yourself well out there, Rocky said as he grabbed a water bottle that one of the men had tossed at him. Most people would have collapsed in fear, but you didn't. And I'm not just talking about today, but all of it, especially the intelligence gathering. Hey, he continued, want to come work with us? Something tells me I could use the help. I looked at him with interest, before nodding slowly. So I did tell you I couldn't really describe that in the introduction in a few seconds. Well, I was right, wasn't I? What do you make of that one? Vampires, the Himalayas, all kinds of weird stuff going on. Um, fantastic, lovely stuff. Delighted to have been given permission to read that five-part story from No Sleep. I hope you all thought it was worth it, because, well, I just love that one. Never quite sure where it's going to go, but it does seem set up for a sequel, doesn't it? I think so anyway. Hoping to see one. Thoughts, feelings, comments in the comment section below the video, and as ever, I'll do my best to reply to you all. Back in Istanbul for a few days, so um, everything's a bit hectic, but I have got stories lined up for you for this week, so don't panic. Until next time, though. Very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?